not this big. Right. Since uh, it's a very long judgment from, from Mrs. Justice yes, Lang, because at that stage there were there were, were lots and lots and lots of things that were an issue, Indeed. Um, um, m many factual issues in issue, uh, all, all, all of which have gone. Indeed, um, a, a lot of legal issues, um, a number of which have gone. Yes. It, it's quite a narrow issue now, isn't it? It is, my lord. Yes. Um, because speaking for myself, and I suspect the whole bench. We've all read the background, mm, yes. um, so we understand the background, but quite a lot of the background now is not relevant to the the issues in the appeal. No, my lord, and in which case, um, if, if taking that steer to, to go very quickly through the background and perhaps simply by reference to the judgment rather than uh, any detailed look at the uh, documents would be the most helpful way. Um, I may just take my lords and my lady to a plan or two so that yes I, I, I would sense. quite like to see a plan yes um, I'll, I'll but I'll like my lord I, I think I've got the picture as it we don't were. need to go through lots otherwise of, um, yes minutes of mm. the states no, no, from 1925 no. and so on we can we can yes. avoid a lot of that yes, yes. Uh, I'm grateful for that indication uh, and um, the decision notice itself is an unremarkable grant of planning permission and, and, and my lords and my lady will have seen that in essence, the challenge focused uh, primarily on the reasons in the officer's report, which is, uh, as is well established, uh, are, are taken to be the reasons for that decision where a committee adopts, adopts the reasons there. Um, now, just before we get into the meat of this, I want to be straightforward as to what Mr Day, my client, is trying to achieve here. Uh, he is seeking, or really on behalf of his community, to try and ensure ultimately that this part of the recreation ground with which we're concerned is restored for uh, recreational use. Now, he's not necessarily going to achieve that even if this appeal is successful, mm. but it would certainly be an important step on the way. Uh, and the result of the judgment below is it's now well recognised that this recreation ground, including the site, was acquired in 1925 for the benefit of the residents and of, of the locality as a phrase used a much needed recreation ground and of course the, the need for it has only intensified in the 95 years since as the area has become more intensively developed. Now the local authority, uh, the town council sold off the land to a developer because uh, they didn't inquire properly into the material factors as the judge has found uh, and didn't subject that sale to the consultation and advertisement in accordance with the statutory requirements. They were, however, made aware, uh, 
sorry, and so my clients weren't aware of that disposal at the time, but they were aware subsequently when the planning application came to be advertised and were in time to challenge that permission and seek the quashing of it. Uh, and one of the outcomes of the High Court judgment was that the judges' criticisms of the way in which both the Town Council and Shropshire Council had gone about their roles in investigating the history of this uh, has now resulted in some sharp criticism from the auditor. And we have that at tab 51 and 52. Uh, and can I just take my laws and my lady to that at, in the supplementary bundle? Right at the end of the supplementary bundle. Just to, clear, yeah. just to clear my own mind and, and, and to see what, what is a, um, now not an issue and what is. Yes. Um, this may be a, a, really a question for Mr Garvey, but as I understand it, um, of the three steps, um, it's now common ground after the judgment that the um, disposal of this land, uh, of the site, uh, to the developer was unlawful because it didn't comply with the Act. The second step is whether, um, after the disposal, uh, the statutory trust, I mean, it, it, it's called a trust in the Act, but it, it, the obligations under the Act, um, uh, are, are, are they, do they um, remain extant after the disposal? Now, that's as I understand it, is an issue. Uh, it is, yes, that's primarily what I would say arises out of my ground one, as it were. What's the, what's the consequence of disposal in breach of, of, of the section 123 procedure? And, and if, if the trust, if these obligations um, survive the disposal, uh, are they enforceable against, um, notably, the developer? Yes. And that's, a, that's, that's an important issue. And that's all, so it's two and three that are an issue? They are an issue. I think what I'm proposing to do is to really focus on, on the challenge in, before the court as well, which is to the, the planning permission itself and the decision to grant the planning permission, because what the court's focus needs to be is, was that decision taken in a lawful way? And in light of the judge's decision, would it have been highly likely to have been the same, but for the, <clears throat> but for the errors? And so really the issue is, is there any uh, continuing or subsisting materiality uh, in the recreational rights that would have or would have influenced that decision, or as the judge says, uh, once those recreational rights became, on her findings, incapable of enforcement, uh, was there nothing left for the planning yeah, committee to that. consider? Uh, and, and so the focus really needs to be on their on their decision making rather than purely on that mm -hmm. question of rights and enforcement. Uh, and that does lead to some nuance in, in the way in which one has to look at the the questions. And I'll, I'll develop that shortly. Yeah, I, I, I do see that. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, just to the, the current state of affairs uh, is that, uh, as your lordship and my lady will see, uh, uh, is this uh, letter at uh, 350 of the supplementary bundle from uh, 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 it's called a public interest report to the town council, uh, and uh, it concerns what are called serious governance weaknesses uh, and an audit as a result. Um, the other matter that arises in consequence of this is then the next tab, tab 52, 353, Shrewsbury Town Council has now appointed a Mr Redfern QC to undertake an independent inquiry into the governance weaknesses identified, uh, and the terms of reference of that are, are, are there at 353, and that's expected to report in January. <coughs> So that's where, where matters stand, and, and I'll come back to it, but I say that can be relevant ultimately to this court's exercise of discretion, because this is still ma a matter in play, and there are possibilities arising from this of remediating the errors that have taken place at the disposal of, of the land. The officer's report, uh, we have that that's the decision in question uh, in the supplementary, bu uh, supplementary bundle. Uh, in light of 
my Lord's indication. I, I'm not going to go to that because most of it's actually in the judgment of the, of the relevant parts, so uh, we needn't turn it up. Um, the officer report ran through the history and then, um, in summary, and this is all in the judgment, advised at 6.1.10 that the, the land was, was not and is not considered to be public open space or recreation ground. And one can see then the advice given was the town council were rightly of the view, so said the officer, that the application site was not open space and therefore they were not required to follow the procedures in section 232 of the Town and Country Planning Act. Um, that's essentially that relates back to section 122 procedures uh, about notification, uh, advertisement and consequences. And then one of the key passages on which the judge relied is 6.1.12 of the officer report, which states that it's the council's opinion that this site is separate to and is not part of the Greenfields Recreation Ground. The development would not result in a loss of open space. It's a vacant site, therefore appropriate in principle. Uh, and at 6.1.14, currently the land is in private ownership, and whilst there is an adjacent recreation ground, the site has been treated separately for many decades and as such it's considered the suggestions that the land was or is public open space are unsubstantiated and therefore cannot be given weight in the planning process. Uh, paragraph two of my skeleton argument, I've set out the, a summary of the judge's findings. Uh, and that's the reference version at tab one. <coughs> And I, I set out there that uh, she, the judge held that uh, the defendant failed to take reasonable steps to acquaint itself with the development site's history and legal status, that's judgment power of 120, and had failed to ascertain whether the development site was part of the recreation ground held in trust for public recreational use, a matter which was plainly a material consideration in deciding whether to grant planning permission. That's at 52 to 57 of the judgment. And upholding ground two of the claim, the judge held the county council failed to take into account material considerations, including relevant documents, and that the land was held in trust for public recreational use. So in essence, upholding what was below grounds one and two, the failure to fulfill what's called the, the shorthand, the tame side duty of uh, taking reasonable steps to investigate material uh, factors and ask the right questions, which as the judge relied on the CPRE and Dover case in the Supreme Court is applied to planning decisions uh, and then simply a failure to take account of material considerations. So those are the two grounds on which the uh, decision was uh, held to have been uh, flawed. Uh, but then the judge, as my laws and my lady would have seen, found the disposal of the development site by the first interested party to the second interested party. She found that although the rights of recreation subsisted. Well, and she uses I, that sorry to interrupt so early, but I think that Mr. Garvey takes issue with that. Um, he says the judge didn't decide. He, he, he does, um, but we can see that in the language of the judgment on a number of occasions. I mean, I, um, the language I saw was insofar as. Indeed. Which didn't see, seem to me to be the judge leaving it open. The, uh, so if, the judgment itself is at, is at paragraph. Uh, I mean, sorry, take it, it in your own time, but just uh, you, I, I, at the moment, I'm, um, I need persuading that she actually reached a, a decision on that point. Yes, well, it, it, in my submission, it's a, it's a very logical and uh, an, an entirely correct approach by the judge that the rights do subsist, uh, even if she. Well, it's a point, actually, that they're, they're not said very much on this appeal. Yes. Okay. Um, what, I, what I will be saying about that is it, it, I think the, the sort of jurisprudential background to what the judge was uh, seeking to apply there was that there are situations where the right and the remedy are divorced and I've given an example which I'll come back to of, of, of where limitation periods have expired that the understanding of, of, of that situation is that a person still has the right but the uh, a respondent or a defendant can take a point against them on limitation but it doesn't mean the right is extinguished uh, and, and that seems to me to be the pattern that the judge was, uh, was adopting in saying that the rights subsist but cannot be enforced. Uh, and in my submission, 
there's, there's some force in both that understanding of the judgment and in that uh, uh, the soundness of that legal approach, as opposed to suggesting that the effect of a disposal in breach of the sentence is to uh, achieve the extinguishment that section 123 2b would achieve if the processes were actually followed. Um, So it is certainly my submission that that is what the judge found in terms of the rights subsisting. Um, the relevant paragraphs are really 113 through to 120, and it's in tab 11. Um, and the final paragraph is perhaps um, 120, uh, where the judge finds that it's highly likely the outcome for the claimant would not have been substantially different if the conduct complained of had not occurred because Shropshire Council would ultimately have concluded that the rights under the statutory trust, insofar as they subsisted, could not be enforced against the owner of the site. And again, I, just picking that point up, it, it wouldn't be logical to suggest they couldn't be enforced if they didn't subsist at all. That wouldn't be a, a point she would be making. She would simply say they don't subsist at all, rather than they can't be enforced. Um, well, anyway, there we are. It's not a ringing finding that they subsist. It's only saying even if they do subsist. But anyway, there we are. The, the issue the, arises. She said that in the in, in the appellant's favour because if they don't subsist, the appellant loses. If the rights don't subsist at all. Uh, well, I, I, I don't accept that 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 is that completely extinguishes the relevance or materiality of the history of the open space of the site. It's still in my submission, open to the committee on remittal to say, this is a, a site that for 95 years has been or is held on trust as a recreation ground. Uh, there are rights that people have to enjoy this land, uh, and that's material to our, to our consideration of planning permission. Uh, in my submission, even if the, uh, the rights are extinguished, that, that can still have a residual impact on the decision. Uh, and that's a core submission. I have to develop that further. But uh, in my submission, even in that circumstance, there's a materiality. Um, the um, small portion of land point is, is, is found against the uh, claimant at uh, paragraph 119. That's, um, uh, that's my ground uh, two. That's obviously the shortest point. Um, paragraph five of my skeleton argument. Uh, I've set out the three grounds in summary. Um, and I'm going to take really three and one together because they do uh, overlap. Um, and I'm, I'm really going to start with three as it happens. But, but one, round one is that although the judge held that following the disposal of the site uh, recreational rights, I say, Subsisted over the site, she erred in building, uh, in holding that sections 128 and 131 abnegated any ma materiality remaining for those subsisting rights, or of the fact that the site had been part of the recreation ground. So that goes to the point I just uh, was responding to my lord on that the fact the site had been part of the recreation ground is still, in my submission, a material consideration for the committee. Uh, she erred in assuming the subsistence <coughs> rights of recreation were only material to the decision if they were enforceable. The subsisting rights and the fact the site formed part of the recreation ground were material. <coughs> and the weight to be attached to those were, of course, for the committee rather than the judge. The second ground is about the small portion. That on the small portion, according to the judge's findings, the public's recreational rights uh, do pertain because it remains part of the <coughs> recreational ground. And so uh, the access to the site uh, is therefore affected by those rights. Uh, and they are, therefore, by implication, enforceable. And so the potential for the access for HGVs to be driving over this portion of land while the construction is going on uh, is a material consideration. Access is classically a, a consideration for a planning committee. And if it can't be accessed, that's a relevant consideration. I mean, that looks well. to me like an evaluative judgment by the judge. Mm. Indeed. Um, so we will have to apply the appropriate principles on an appeal, that apply on an appeal to a review of that type of decision. Well, in, 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 I, indeed, I accept that. But the, the basic position in all challenges to 
planning decisions is that evaluative judgments of that kind are for the committee rather than for the judge. So that's the starting point in appro well, approaching I that, see. that So you, mm. yes, I see, I see. And then ground three uh, relates to the judge's application of section 31-2A, the Senior Courts Act. Had the County Council understood the development site was not separate to the recreation ground, but a part of it and held under a statutory trust for the public benefit, had it understood that public recreational rights subsist, notwithstanding the disposal, those were factors which could have influenced the decision whether to grant planning permission, having regard to the policy context, including <coughs> CS 17 of the local plan, that's part of the development plan, and paragraph 97 of the national uh, planning policy framework. The judge erred in presuming that it was highly unlikely that the County Council's decision would have been the same in light of a proper uh, investigation and understanding of the legal and factual issues. <coughs> so what I, my Lord and my Lady, what I propose to uh, do this morning is to um, take my Lords and my Lady through the judgment and then deal on a simple basis on ground three, which I say is the simplest basis on which the appeal should be allowed. Uh, and by that ground, my submission is assume the judge was correct on every aspect of the legal findings and her fact on, on the facts of the law, uh, and even as to sections 128 and 131, but quite simply, the fact that the site was open space, was subject to the trust, even leaving aside the, the judge's view as to the effect of the disposal, that was a material consideration which was indeed capable of influencing the decision of the committee. Can I just see that I've got that um, submission right? So you say, uh, suppose that the judge was right in concluding, using the vernacular, uh, that um, even though the council didn't go about things the right way, there was nothing really that could be done about it because the developers now got ownership of the land, nobody can challenge that, and uh, there's no means of enforcing um, the right to use it as open space, uh, and therefore he could um, potentially do with his land as he wished, subject to getting appropriate planning permission. Uh, you say uh, it would nevertheless be part of the material factors for the planning committee to take into account uh, when weighing uh, up whether or not to grant him permission to develop, uh, that all of this had happened and that initially that land was intended for use as open space and the council had precluded it from being uh, used as open space by its behaviour and therefore you say the judge couldn't then step into the arena and make her own decision about what would happen in that situation. Is that is that the point? That, that my lady summarises um, well what I'm going to be saying. There are, mm. there are more details as sure. to why I say that. Uh, one, for example, which I will develop again mm. shortly, is that open space, uh, when one looks at it through the lens of the development plan, the strategy that the planning committee was trying to implement and the national planning policy framework, mm. has value even where it's only for visual amenity reasons. So open space can include inaccess inaccessible areas. And so yes. it's still relevant to the strategy of the development plan to consider, well, this is a site that's always has been open space. Okay, it's in private ownership, but many open mm -hmm. spaces are. What do we make of that as the committee? And that's a matter for the committee. Should we, should we refuse planning permission to ensure its openness for visual purposes for the, greater, for the better benefit of the recreation mm -hmm. ground? So even in that context where it's moved into private ownership, they're not permitting access to it, but open space is still a relevant consideration in, in that planning decision. That's, that's one of the, the more detailed factors. But yes, uh, my, my lady puts the point correctly. And I I'm just wanted to, to make sure I understood it, but yes. obviously I have. And, and, and I, I start with that ground because it doesn't involve having to unpick uh, much of the judge's decision in order to do so. Uh, and then I'll come back to the uh, more knotty problem of the, the ground one, uh, what, what is the result of the disposal in breach of the statutory uh, provisions uh, and then finish with ground two, what's the uh, access arrangements issue and that's and its materiality. Um, I addressed the, the uh, cross appeal on costs of paragraph six of the skeleton, I'm not going to pick that up now, I'll pick that up uh, later. So um, if we move swiftly on then just to the factual background, uh, I've set that out, my, my lords and my lady have seen it at the 
in the judgment I set it out at paragraph 7, a summary of my skeleton. Uh, my client, uh, Mr. Day, lives on Fullstar Street in Shrewsbury. Uh, and um, uh, I, at this point, we can get out a plan. Um, <coughs> And if we go to the officer's report, excuse me, is um, and one at tab 44. Yes, it's the one at 40. Thank you, I'm grateful. 4-0. Four, four four yes. Uh, on the very front page of that, uh, we can see the layout of the land. So um, uh, one can see that uh, Percy Street is in, the, uh, is in the middle, and then to the right of that on the plan is Fullstaff Street at a, a slight north-east direction and then that leads up to the rectangular roughly rectangular shaped site which is bounded by an orange line and is sort of hatched in a darker green and then over to the center right one sees recreation ground is marked and so my client lives on Fullstaff Street leading on to that uh, recreation ground at the top of Fullstaff Street is the car park and then where it says car, in car park, uh, the court may be able to discern a slight change of colouring. That's the so-called small portion. So that's not within the ownership of the developer. That's within the ownership of the town council. And so is the area still subject to the statutory trust, but uh, over which the developer's access will take place. So they will, the, the lorries will drive up and down Full Staff Street across the car park that is for the recreation ground and into the site. Uh, and then similarly, uh, access arrangements for cars once the 16 houses or 12 houses there are built. We'll go over that. We'll, we'll have to land. go over that because yes, that's, that's how it connects mm. to, the, mm. Uh, mm. to the network. Yes, I see. So I think um, that's probably all I need to say about the, the layout. But the, one can see then the base architect's drawing um, at tab 43. So what's the ruin that is off the land in question? That's uh, of no relevance to the issues in this case, but uh, I just saw there was a ruin. Um, to the, uh, to the uh, that would have been, I think, a remaining part of the old um, Broom Hall Manor, right. which once stood there. Um, okay. Just from Thank memory, you. having looked at lots of ancient documents on oh, this. Okay. Thank that you was. very much. Um, so, yes, tab 43 is the architect's site plan. Uh, and again, one sees here just the layout of the uh, access road and the site, oh, the private road, and then. Um, one can see the, the sort of kink <coughs> over the existing car park where at the bottom right mm. where the uh, access will need to um, be gained. So the the the, um, the part of the, the the part of the site which uh, mm. the developer does not own um, th that's the that's the part at the end of Falstaff Street yes. over which the some easement or there will be some easement. Will there? Yes. So, uh, and that's currently car park. Yes. Yes, thank you. <coughs> uh, so, yes, so we can see this area, with the exception of that part, was the, was the part that was transferred to the second interested party in 2017. Um, and we've got the land registry documents 
would show the ownership uh, within the bundle. So, for example, just at the preceding page 255, it's one of the plans from the land registry. Uh, and I won't go through them all, but yeah, that's helpful they're there too. just um, mm. so we, we yeah. have the picture. Um, of course, typical land registry plan, it doesn't actually show the carve out for the uh, car park. Yes, I think there is one possibly, my lady, amongst the many in here. It's just, there got, a straight, it's just got a straight line down. It does, so it doesn't have the easement on that one. No. But I think there may be one uh, where the easement is shown, but um, uh, I don't think anything turns on it. Um, so then, uh, my lords, the, the history, uh, probably best just to zoom through in the judgment uh, and I, I, I really won't detain you because I know that you have read it and I'll just really tick off um, the, the most relevant paragraphs so it's 2, it's two to 35 we've got the full sort of background history uh, and, and no, no issues are taken with that um, the key points are uh, that the Mayor of Alderman and Burgesses of Borough of Shrewsbury in 1926 acquired the two parcels, what are called the Barker land and the Kemper land, uh, and then um, for the provision of a recreation ground. And the judge found that there was compelling evidence that they were provided, uh, that, that the purpose was to provide a recreation ground. Um, and then there's a, um, a plan in this, uh, just one of the historic documents, I think that's the only one I will, will flag up, is a 1935 document. It's at tab 5, page 57 of the supplementary bundle. No. 62, tab 5, page 62. This was actually disclosed, as the judge records, by the solicitor for Shropshire Council in the course of the proceedings. This is a document the judge said should have been located if searches had been done. Uh, the bottom right on page 62, one can see the date is March 1935. And if one looks back at the, uh, one can see Fullstaff Street is the bottom right hand road leading onto the recreation ground. And at that point, there's no physical separation between the site and the remainder of the recreation ground, and one sees marked there the Broom Hall Manor that my my lord asked about, um, yes. that, that may now be in a state of ruin. And so, um, the judge, amongst other evidence, concluded that the recreation ground had, by this point, some nine years after acquisition, in fact, been provided on the totality of the Barker parcel and the Kappa parcel that had been bought in 1926. But it, it, as I understand it, it's now common ground that immediately before the disposal to the developer, uh, the site uh, um, was um, uh, subject to um, what we can call the statutory trust. Yes. And, and, and that's the origin of it. And, and then there was a lot of examination of what war. happened in the war and allotments and so on. But all of that was resolved in the claimant's favour. Uh, and so the, from inception in 1926 through to 2017, uh, there's the, the factual findings are it was it was impressed with statutory trust. So, jumping in that therefore to 2017, uh, the site is disposed of to uh, CSE developments. Uh, the area edged red is is transferred. The area marked blue. The easement area is retained. Uh, it was subject to an overage agreement, which is in the supplementary bundle. So in the event that the land is developed, they'll be up, a proportion of the uplift will uh, accrue to the town council. Uh, so they still stand to benefit from that. Uh, and then um, uh, it's common ground. There was no consultation <coughs> before uh, the sale. The officer report is uh, summarized uh, and the judge notes at paragraph 52 of her judgment that there was an initial uh, report in February and then a further meeting in August. Uh, and then uh, she summarises some of the key uh, passages. 
at uh, the following paragraphs on page 112 onwards, quotes in full really the key parts uh, and though the main points that she then picks up on are on 114, 6.1.10 through to 6.1.13 and I'll just highlight the first sentence of 6.1.12 sorry is, where I, I'm also sorry, sorry page 114 tab 11 uh, yeah one. yeah page 114 sorry yes apologies Thank you. Uh, sorry. yep 6.1.12 the officer's <coughs> advice to the committee was it's the council's opinion this site is separate to and not part of the Greenfield investigation ground the development would not result in the loss of public open space and 6.1.13 last sentence on the page currently the land is in private ownership and whilst there is an adjacent recreation ground the site has been treated separately for many decades and as such it's considered that suggestions the land was or is public open space are unsubstantiated and therefore cannot be given weight in the planning decision process The judge then summarises the grounds of challenge, and at 49, uh, so 45, I'm going to come back to this shortly, <coughs> might as well flag it up while we're here, refers to the development plan policies CS6, uh, which provides that uh, council should ensure all development contributes to the health and well-being of communities, including safeguarding residential and local amenity and the achievement of local standards for the provision and quality of open space. The explanation to policy CS6 then quoted, and then CS17, another development core strategy policy, refers to the explanation <coughs> at paragraph 7.9 to Shropshire Council's open space, sport and recreation study, and observes that to be of importance, an area of open space need not have a formal use or be accessible to the general public as long as it contributes to the character and appearance of its locality. So that's the point I alluded to in answer to my lady's question about uh, accessibility not being a, a key criterion uh, in terms of the value of open space in planning terms. Uh, and we can see that also in the national planning policy framework, uh, which um, the judge cites, um, paragraph 97, <clears throat> on the previous page at, pa at paragraph 43 of her judgment which says that existing open space, sports and recreation buildings and land including playing fields should not be built on and then it says unless an assessment has been undertaken showing its surplus to requirements the loss resulting from the proposed development would be replaced by equivalent or better provision in terms of quantity and quality in a suitable location all the development is for alternative sports and recreational provision the needs for which clearly outweigh the loss um, that policy reflects a very long-standing approach to open space going back in policy to the old PPG 17 and one sees it also reflected in a number of statutory instruments for example where land is compulsorily acquired uh, equivalent uh, open space land has to be provided in, in many circumstances um, I've also got the <coughs> definition here I've, um, which was intended to be included in the bundle of authorities but it's from the uh, MPPF. What I've done is put these in folders uh, in the hope that I could then leave them open for you to take out because I know I'm trying to be very sensitive yeah, about it. Um, so if I were to open them uh, like that, I, I hope that those could then be passed up. Would that be a, a, an acceptable Yes, that's way fine. To, Would uh, you like to do that? <coughs> yes. We're happy for you yeah. to do that. So there are three authorities. I'll just, I'll, I'll take them um, There's the NPPF open space definition, and that goes behind tab 48. 
Then there's the full judgment in Edwards, which just didn't make its way in because it's reported in a strange way, uh, which goes behind 31. Just a moment, sorry. So the first one... The first, so... Um, the first I've got here is Edward, the is House of Lords and Edwards. Edwards, that goes behind tab 31 in the authorities. 31, right. 31, right. I yeah, guess. Right. And then the NPPF goes behind 48. And the Williams case, which is a judgment of my Lord for Justice Hickenbottom in the first instance, is an additional authority on open space, which I'm going to come to very shortly. So wh where does the NPPF go? Uh, behind 48, my Lord. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> and so picking up the NPPF definition of open space, one again sees in that definition that as with the core strategy, so it's the third definition from the bottom, open space for the purposes of paragraph 97 means all open space of public value, including not just land, but also areas of water such as rivers, canals, lakes and reservoirs, which offer important opportunities for sport and recreation and can act as a visual amenity. Again, picking up that point that open space doesn't need to be accessible in order to have value in terms of visual amenity. Returning to the judgment of tab 11 then, uh, the judge summarizes the uh, legal principles which are uh, uncontroversial, don't require any elaboration, at paragraphs 49 to 51. And then one sees at 53, the judge picked out that passage from 6.1.12, tab 11, page 120, it's the council's opinion the site is separate to and is not part of the <coughs> recreation ground. Uh, and then 56, uh, to uh, 57, we see the finding that. Uh, That's the document you just shown us. Uh, yes, correct. And the finding that that was a relevant document which could have been revealed by further investigations hmm. prior to the completion of the officer report. And she concludes two thirds of the way down 57 that these matters were plainly material considerations which should have been taken into account. So we see the preface of her, her subsequent <coughs> finding there that grounds one and two succeed. Then there's a, a whole section which again is now uncontroversial about the status of the land that runs uh, right through. Uh, and I will take all of that as read for now. Uh, and then through to uh, 77, 78, where the judge considers some of the authority on the effect of statutory trusts. Uh, and 78, the term trust is not used in the PHA, Public Health Act 1875, unlike the OSA 1906. Nonetheless, a statutory trust has been held to arise under both acts, as uh, my Lord, Lord Justice Higginbottom observed in the Friends of Finsbury Park. Uh, citing a number of authorities that they are uh, construed to have a similar uh, effect, both of those two provisions. Uh, we have that decision, the Finsbury again, Park case. But again, this, is, this, this um, proposition is uncontroversial. Indeed. Yeah. Um, I, I, statutory trust is, is used in all of the, that, that phrase is used in all of the cases, and, 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 and the word trust is used in, the, in one of the acts. Um, I mean, it, 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 um, it, it's obviously not a private trust. It, it, it's a trust, isn't it? Which um, uh, it, it's a trust in the sense that um, the statute uh, imposes obligations to maintain land as recreational land. Um, that, that, that's what it means, isn't it, by a trust? Uh, uh, my suspicion means two things. One, one is that. And the other is that uh, 
the correlative of that, and we see that in a lot of authorities, is that the public are then the beneficiary of rights yes. of recreation yes. Yes. over that. So it's not just about the obligations on the trustee, it's also about the uh, beneficiary's rights, yes. to use that private law analogy, which we, which we know is not quite exact. But um, They may not have rights to the land, but they have rights arising from its use or the dedication of its use. To, to, to recreation on yes. the land, yes. And, and, and indeed, uh, my Lord's um, judgment in Finsbury Park case at tab 41, the following paragraph, paragraph 17, which the judge below didn't cite, actually makes that point that uh, my, my Lord said, therefore the council hold the park under section 10 of the 1906 Act on statutory trust for the use by the public for its recreation, such that it has been said that the public are its beneficial owners, C. Blake and Hending Corporation, 1962, where such a trust exists, it's well established that the public have a statutory right to use the land for recreational purposes, C. Barkus against North Yorkshire County Council, 2015, Lord, no Lord Newberger about this brief. Therefore, generally, the local authority owner must allow the public the free and unrestricted use of it. So that, that, that encapsulates the, the point in answer to my Lord's uh, question. It's, it's both a, a, a set of obligations and a set of uh, rights. Um, I'm conscious that the court wants to get to the meat of this, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to... Um, jump straight to my grounds now rather than go through because I, I can see that the court is well, well familiar with what the judge decided um, and so I come to my ground three and I've set this out at um, paragraphs 65 onwards of my skeleton argument <coughs> set out there that obviously if I succeed on one of the other grounds then um, this ground doesn't arise but um, I, I set out section 31 2a of the Senior Courts Act which the court will no doubt be very familiar with if um, the High Court must refuse to grant relief on an application for judicial review and may not make or award under section subsection 4 on such an application uh, if it appears to the court to be highly likely that the outcome for the applicant would not have been substantially different if the conduct complained of had not occurred, and then I cite paragraph 120 of the judgment, which I've already uh, taken the court to, uh, and the submission in summary is that while that's an ingenious application of section 31 2a, it ultimately relies on the assumption that the planning committee would have given no weight to the fact that the site was in truth part of the recreation ground. And um, in my submission, the judge's premise for assuming it's highly likely that the committee would take the same decision is, is again, is flawed. Firstly, I submit the relevance of the judge's findings that the site had been procured by the local authority and held as a piece of open space on trust for the residents for a very long time until it was sold under a mistaken misapprehension that it was to be treated as a vacant development site. That history and that fact was an obviously relevant matter. Uh, as the judge herself, in fact, acknowledges in the judgment, the ability of that factor to have influenced the decision-making of the committee was not limited to the narrow legal analysis of whether the public continued to enjoy enforceable rights of access and recreation over the land. So I leave that question to ground one. But assuming the judge on that point, uh, we, we leave that stand. Uh, and there are three main reasons for why that is. First, and this I say is conclusive by itself, is that the committee was not constrained as a matter of law 
to take account of the preservation of open space only if enforceable legal rights over that space persisted. The preservation of open space was a relevant factor dictated by the strategy of the development plan, which we've just seen, and national planning policy framework policy, which we've just seen. And both of those forms of policy, which is of course the way in which decisions are taken by planning agencies, <coughs> are clear that open space performs an amenity function by being retained in an open state. And so that's not restricted to land over which there are enforceable rights to recreate for the public. And so it was a matter for the committee to decide what weight to give to those policies and their application to this site. And of course it's axiomatic that the court cannot put itself in the position of the decision maker on such matters, provided those matters are material. See the Gaffer Cole decision, I'll come back to that at the paragraph 38. So it was for them, the committee, in light of that policy, to decide whether they should consider it should uh, the land should be developed as was proposed. So I've taken the court both to the core strategy definition and the open space definition, and we see both development plan and national policy uh, refer to amenity and visual amenity value of open space. And then the final point really on this is um, if the, they then took the, care, the, the decision that this was to be regarded as open space, which might have such value as they, or such weight as they gave it, the point at my paragraph 72 of my skeleton argument that what the national planning policy framework then requires is a staged, <clears throat> is a staged approach as to whether uh, applying that policy permission should be granted and that includes whether the land is surplus to requirements or alternatively whether an equivalent quantity and quality of open space should apply. Now all of those considerations have never been approached by the committee, but in my submission are clearly capable of influencing its decision, and it can't be said it's highly likely that applying all those open space considerations, the committee would inevitably come to the same conclusion that the land should be granted permission, which would, of course, end all public uh, uh, potential for use, and indeed uh, for the openness and the visual uh, amenity from that openness. that's the first point why I say she was wrong in her application of section 31 to A. So do you say that, for example, it would have been open to the committee applying the NPPF um, to have said, well, um, it, it's uh, water under the bridge that we have um, unfortunately sold off part of the recreation ground when we thought it wasn't part of the recreation ground. Uh, and the developers being given rights, but um, bearing in mind the NPPF and the uh, provisions of that, um, we should say to the developer, if you want planning permission, you should um, either make a financial con contribution under a 106 agreement or um, provide us with some uh, equivalent land from elsewhere to make up for the land that um, we've disposed of. Th that was wholly open. I mean can't demand the developer do that, obviously. No, of they, they can't. But they, they can refuse the permission saying no equivalent yeah. uh, quantity and quality being provided, not compliant with policy. Mm. Um, they could say, we might be minded to grant permission for a less intrusive development. This one abnegates all visual amenity value of this piece of land. This was open space. This was an important part. Mm. Now we know that. Okay, you can have permission for, for less houses. But mm. All of those considerations are for the committee, and they were clearly, in my submission, relevant. And it, and it can't say it's highly likely that this development would inevitably have been granted permission. The, 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 I mean, your your, your yeah. point on, on this seems to me that uh, even if the committee didn't know that this was public open space with the trust attached, yeah, um, they should have taken into account that it was open space. Mm. Well, indeed. I mean, I mean right. that's another way. Of um, it, yes. and that's it, isn't it? I mean, that, yeah. that, that that's your point. Mm. And and uh, I mean. Uh, this is something probably for um, uh, Mr. Garvey, perhaps. But um, are, are you saying, because this has 
no, nothing to do with the public open space point at all, really. Not um, the complexities of it. No. no. <laughs> um, and and did the um, committee, the officer's report, really, um, did the committee n not take into account that this was open space? Well, well, and that's very clear from the officer's report. Right. He says it's a matter to give no weight to. That it's open space to, at all. Right. <laughs> Indeed, I, I, think, I hope I took the call yes, to that right. passage yeah. a moment ago. Um, um, thank you. Point one, point 13 of the officer's report, or 14, um, very starkly says that, that, that no weight can be given to it. But I'm, I'm getting a little confused here. Um, <clears throat> I understood they said, but my understanding is they say it's, it's not public open space. I was just wondering whether my lord and lady's questions were directed to whether it was just open space as yes. opposed to public open space. The, the, the epithet public um, is a distraction that, right. uh, in my submission, shouldn't have crept into the officer's report either. Uh, it's certainly but sorry, just to interrupt you, I mean, you, you can have plenty of what you might in common parlance call open space. Um, which is not subject and never has been subject to any of the statutory rights which arise in this case. Yes. But we're not concerned, are we, with that type of open space? Well... Are, aren't we here? We, isn't we the relevant factor here that this land was, and that a new submit still is, subject to the statutory um, restrictions, if you like, or obligations and rights. For planning purposes, <coughs> a, a piece of land that is simply held by a private landowner uh, over which there is no trust or yeah. no particular designation yeah. can still be regarded as open space. But is that what this planning. case is about? Yeah. Well, that's what the, the, the ground three that goes to the... But I thought ground three was still focusing on the history of this site as having formed, having been acquired yes. pursuant to one of the statutory provisions and therefore being subject to the statutory obligations or trust. I didn't think we what? were talking about a land that just happens never to have been developed and is therefore in that sense open land. What I'm trying to do with ground Based. three is, is, is assume against <coughs> myself on the other points about the effect of the trust and so on, but just to challenge the exercise... No, I follow that, but I'm trying to understand by reference to what are you yeah. seeking to challenge it? Are you seeking to... Because what you have in your favour are the judge's findings about the history of this site, and that's clearly what the whole energy has been focused on. Um, but I, what's slightly causing me some confusion is right. is that, that there seem the, the possibility that never mind the history of the site, never mind whether it was ever subject to any statutory restrictions, the fact that it's a piece of undeveloped land um, is, is something that the planning committee should have had regard to and didn't. Is it? And I didn't understand that to be an issue in this appeal. My submission would be, even on that very n narrow understanding of, 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 the, of the site... It is Sorry, what is the narrow understanding so the, of the site? All that we have now is a privately owned piece of land. Forget all the history. Here's just a piece of land next to the recreation ground. Even then, it might be... But is that... An, that the, the judge didn't address that, did she? I mean, that wasn't a point put to the judge, was it? No, no the judge's conclusion... No, but I don't... I didn't, sorry, I'm, I'm really having genuine difficulty with this. I, I, I didn't understand <coughs> that to be something which was raised uh, in um, before the judge. I, I'm sorry, and to add to that, because I'm, I'm in, in similar difficulties... Mm -hmm. You're on ground three. Yeah. So ground three um, uh, presupposes an error of law, and we've seen what the error of law I is. The error of law was that um, it was not understood by the committee that this was um, open space subject to a trust. That was the error. Well, the judge also found that the error was the failure to ascertain the whole history of the site. Well, yes, but and if they'd done that, they would have come, would have known yeah. what we now know to be the case. But Th yes, that's, well, that's what the focus of this is. Yes, but that's why one gets to the judge's exercise under Section 31-2A. She says, well, even if they'd known all this, yes. they'd have still come to the same conclusion. No, I understand that. I understand so that. I'm challenging that, that, that indeed. And, and particular exercise of her, of her The history is critical to that, isn't it? And, uh, I beg your pardon. The right? history is critical to that. 
the, the history I say is, is highly relevant to that. And, and, well, is it, and, and is it not relevant. critical if, if you didn't have this history? I mean, it's, if it's, you didn't have the history, then... If like this was never open space to which a trust or statutory obligation applied, then, then this would be a very different case. Then the officer's advice would be much more accurate because the officer's advice was precisely that. There is no history. It's a vacant yeah, site. Yes. Exactly. Yes. exactly. So, so I, sorry, I, I started this because I didn't quite... I, I sort of sensed a, a sort of drift uh, from what I had understood to be the, the nub issues here. Uh, we are focusing, are we not, on the status of this land as having been subject query whether it still is, but undoubtedly having been subject for many years, from 1925 to 2017, to the statutory um, trust stroke obligations. We are in the context of whether that was capable of therefore influencing... Indeed, absolutely. That I understand. Case. That I understand. Now, what? let me move on slightly, if I may. What I'm still a little unclear <coughs> about on ground three is whether... Um, your ground three applies only if the land remains after 2017 subject to the statutory trust, albeit that that is not enforceable, assuming for the moment. No, for, for ground three, I, I, I don't. Or whether you say it was a relevant factor for the committee to have regard to that although the land was no longer subject to any statutory trust, it had been subject to it from 1925 to 2017. Yes, the latter point. The latter, thank you very much. It, I mean, if, if, if indeed it was still subject to statutory trust, a fortiori it was relevant. Yeah. But, uh, well, I, it's, it's yes, off, but I, I mean, they are slightly different issues. I think. In, indeed. But yes. And are you going to address both of them? Yes. Yes, uh, OK. If um, taking the... The question, uh, so if, if it was merely the history that was relevant uh, and there was no further subsisting yeah. recreational rights, even then I submit that was a relevant factor to the committee's consideration that it had a history of being open space. And the fact that there was the breach of duty in disposing of it in the way in which it was disposed of. Yes. And that's all part and parcel of it, isn't it? It is, my lady. And, and that comes then um, really to my second and third points on why I say it was material. Because um, if, uh, just pursuing that point, let's suppose that the council had jumped through all the relevant hurdles. And well, yes, yeah, let's test it this way. Suppose that the council had done the right thing and had um, consulted, uh, uh, and therefore the statutory so-called trust disappears as a result of the operation of the statute. Uh, you've still got the same history. Yes. Uh, which is that for many, many years prior to the disposal of the land to the developer, um, it's been used for recreational use. But um, the council has deliberately... Um, jumped through the relevant hurdles and sold it off to a developer. In those circumstances, uh, would you still be submitting that it would be a material consideration in granting planning permission that it had been uh, historically um, devoted to recreational use for many, many years? Uh, Malady, I hadn't actually um, thought of that hypothetical scenario, but my submission is yes, it would be. You'd have to say that, wouldn't you, for your ground three? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and that's because uh, it's it's open to the committee to make planning decisions in terms of the long-term planning strategy for its area. Uh, and remember here, the planning authority is the county council, not the yeah. town council yes. who would have discharged the trust. So it's up to them to decide what's in the long-term uh, strategy interests. And... Uh, applying development plan and national policy. Now, yeah. both local policy, the development plan and national policy, resist the loss of open space. And it'd be open, in my lady's scenario, for the county council to say, well, we see what the local town council wants to do, but we don't agree that's in the strategic interests of planning in this area. 
Uh, and we think the history of this site as open space is an important factor, and its continued preservation remains material. And so we refuse permission for its development, notwithstanding yeah. the town council's aspirations to have sold it off for development. And you say that even if there was never any trust over the site? No, this was on right. my lady's hypothesis that there had been the history of the trust, but the town council had sought to bring, brought it to had brought it to an end lawfully. I understand. Yeah. But the, the county council simply says, "Well, that's not our planning view of this site. You may want to develop it for houses, but we consider that there's a dire need for, for a recreation ground yeah. here, and, and so yeah, uh, that's that. still material to our decision." Yeah. And. And the county council may take that view because in the long run, of course, the whole point of planning control is to steer the way in which land is developed within its area. And so in the long run, by refusing planning permission, it may well be that the land comes back to use uh, by the community, which of course is my client's long-term objective. So uh, what it really boils down to, uh, I think, is that um, the judge's approach is tantamount to treating the history, if you like, of the site as an immaterial consideration because and it, it, once you accept that it's a material consideration to be taken into account in the planning balance, um, the court can't, without uh, the benefit of a crystal ball, say, well, it would be inevitable that you come up with a, a situation <coughs> which it was treated as, as negated by other other factors. Or, well, or indeed, my lady, that's a contradiction within the judgment. Yeah. Because the, the judge below yeah, accepts that these are obviously material yeah, considerations. Yes. Um, that the whole history of the site should have been taken into account. Uh, now, my learned friend turns that round and, in his cost appeal and says, well, given that, there was never any need to have gone into it, and so uh, that, that's the premise of his, of his appeal mm. on the cost point. But I, in my submission, it's much more a, a point in my favour that the mm. judge herself accepted that this whole history was material. And to say that all of that mm. is abnegated by this uh, legal construction that because the rights over it aren't enforceable took that uh, legalism much too far mm. and in reality no planning committee is going to approach the question in that way mm. um, and I appeal to, to, to realism here because that is what the Court of Appeal has said in Gathercole is the point of section 31-2A to achieve realism so I'll take, I'll take you to, uh, to paragraph 38 of Gathercole in a second but that was a case where the Court of Appeal was saying, you've raised some arid Section 149 public sector equality duty challenge to a planning permission. You've just done it for technocratic legal reasons. There's no real issue here. We all can see that. You've got a legal point, but we're not going to quash because it would have made no difference. And the Court says, be realistic. That's what Section 31 a is promoting. I say, that's source for the goose. It's source for the gander. Be realistic about the way in which a committee would also approach this decision. And I say this having sat on many planning committees and council committees myself. You're giving I, evidence. <laughs> <laughs> the a planning committee is not going to be uh, looking at that narrow legalistic concept and saying, oh, well, uh, the rights are no longer enforceable. That exhausts all relevance of this planning history. Well, it might take a pragmatic view, mightn't it? Um, planning committee might might look at it and say, "Well, um, it's all water under the bridge. Um, it's most unfortunate that this has happened, but now um, the reality is on the ground that it can't be used as amenity space because um, you can't, um, on this hypothesis, you can't enforce it against the developer. They're the owners of the land. They can't do it. They can't be made to give it back. They can't be made to. Uh, the only thing that we could do is stop them building on it. But then, uh, what good is that going to do? Um, and therefore, we'll, we'll, we'll treat it as a fait accompli and grant the permission. That's a possibility. But you would say it's not the only possibility. My, my lady, absolutely. Yeah. Unless that is highly likely, in the words of the statutory provision then the judge was wrong to assume yeah. that. The history, of course, includes the 2012 planning permission. It does. On that, there was a point before the judge which isn't determined in the judgment, which, uh, by which it, it's actually, it, it was a, a decision in principle in 2012 that was then uh, perfected in 2016 by a grant. Um, yes. And uh, there was a question at the time, because we were in 2019, as my mm -hmm. Lord will know, permissions run for three years, whether it was still capable of enforcement. And mm. one of my contentions was it was incapable because there were um, 
outstanding conditions that hadn't been that couldn't be fulfilled, fulfilled in time. Uh, the judge didn't actually determine that point, so that's essentially an undetermined question whether that's capable of implementation. That's helpful, thank you. Yes. Um, now, what, just just to pick up on, finally on this, um, paragraph one one three of the judgment is is also relevant to this because what the judge said there was that she assumed if this claim succeeds, the uh, second interested party will presumably try and void the contract. Um, uh, this is two thirds of the way down. She says. Um, one, 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 three. One, one, three of the judgment. So yes. that's page 135 <coughs> of the core bundle. Um, she says, if, if the freehold is of no benefit to IP2, the site cannot be developed. Presumably, IP2 will seek to set aside the sale or seek compensation from the town council for its financial loss if this claim succeeds. Now, that kind of observation is actually, in my submission, very helpful to me because it demonstrates that the long-term plan, the long-term goal, is something that's open to the committee because, as she says, this developer can't develop the land. Maybe they'll try and avoid the contract, or maybe they'll simply just sell it back to the local authority, which is certainly what my client seeks to happen. And in that case, then the site would be retained as open space in the long term. Uh, and so that more substantive objective of retaining open space uh, would be achieved. Well, that's in an ideal world from your client's position. The alternative is it gets sold back, they go through the relevant statutory hoops and um, do what they should have done in the first place, and it ends up with the same developer with the benefit of planning permission. It, it's, that's also a remote possibility, but in, in view of the public campaign around this now and the recognition that it is part of the recreation ground, which was never yeah. understood, that's in my submission actually unlikely, right. uh, if there was an opportunity to, uh, to remediate all of this. <coughs> so the chance of this actually getting to the end goal that my clients seek is not a fanciful possibility. It's one the judge expressly contemplated. <clears throat> so I, I, I'll call that um, the second reason that uh, I, I say that um, the Section 31-2A judgment was wrong. And now the third reason um, is that the, in my submission, the relevance of private ownership of the land is overstated by the judge. Uh, and that's because I submit private open space can, as I've said, perform a visual amenity function in private ownership. And again, that's a matter for the committee, as I say, at 67 of my skeleton. And this is where the Wilkinson case of my Lord, uh, Lord Justice Hickenbottom is useful for sort of illustrative purposes of, of, in understanding this. Um, uh, it's the, the relevant passage starts at paragraph 16. So this was the additional authority. <clears throat> so in this case, the inspector had afforded the use of open space uh, limited weight because he said it was privately owned. And we see that in the officer's report. So the, uh, the officer's report, um, paragraph 16. The officer's report dealt with the issue as follows. This is an open space point. Objectors consider the loss of green space and habitat. I'm sorry, which paragraph? Sorry, it's paragraph 16, 16. in the judgment. Yeah. Objectors consider the loss of green space and habitat is detrimental to the community. It's noted, however, that the gardens and landscaped areas are privately owned and would be replaced by, albeit in some instances, smaller similar provision. Objectors have stated that the central garden area has been used by the public throughout the time the development has existed, as is the footpath through the development. Given the current legal status of the land is a privately owned, and that the footpath is a permissive route, this is an adverse impact that can be afforded only limited weight in the balance. So <coughs> pausing there, even on that approach, limited weight. So matters of weight, of course, are <coughs> axiomatically ones for the committee. Even limited weight <coughs> acknowledges the materiality of the recreational right. Uh, over the privately owned uh, open space. So even on that limited weight approach, <coughs> um, that's different to the approach that was advised by the officers to the committee in this case. 
But the judgment's much stronger than that, because paragraphs 21 and 22, my lord, uh, held that if there was a breach of the development plan policy on open space, then the failure to appreciate that there was a breach of that policy, the misleading on the point, was a matter on which the judgment needed to be remitted. And so we see halfway down 21, I accept it might well have been open to the DMZ to give it little weight. Weight is quintessentially a matter for the planning decision makers. However, in this shape, frankly and properly conceded, if there was a breach of policy DP8, unappreciated by the DMC, then that would be the wrong approach to open space. The presumption in section 38.6 of the 2004 Act would have applied. I say similarly here, having we've seen the development plan policies in issue here. And then uh, my lord said, I'm not persuaded a mere mention of the policy in the annex which lists relevant policies the DMC members would have appreciated the breach of the development plan which the loss of open space involves, particularly as Ms Graham Paul pointed out, policy DPA deals not only with the protection of existing open space but the requirement to make positive provision for public open space whereas in this case a new development comprises of two or more dwellings. The officer's report unfortunately did not hint at the loss of open space being a breach of the development plan. And so similarly here, the officer's report by virtue of deeming no way to be given to open space clearly doesn't go on to address breach of development plan policies or the MPPF. And I submit this situation is therefore analogous. And the judge's reason is not sufficient for the unenforceability of the rights to dispose of the relevance of open space. And so this was a case where she should have uh, remitted the question to the committee for its consideration of the materiality of that open space. Now, this again is on the assumption, is it, that for shorthand we'll call it the statutory trust, um, continues, notwithstanding the transfer in 2017, but is unenforceable as against the landowner. Uh, it, it, is, it is both on that assumption and on any premise that it may have come to an end. It doesn't, my point doesn't need to rest on that premise. Well, so of, of you're of saying either it came to, it doesn't matter. It, the, the assumption, which of course is, is a finding, uh, is that it was, the land was subject to the statutory trust at least until 2017. Yes. And you say, well, it, it's um, a relevant factor for the planning committee, either that it it was um, subject to the statute of trust until 2017, even if it thereafter ceased to be, yes. or a fortiori, if the statutory trust continued. Yes. But on the on the first of the, oh, well, I'm not sure it's the first or the second, but on the one that says that the statutory trust assumption, if you like, the statutory trust ceased in 2017. Leave aside questions of enforceability, the statutory trust simply ceased. On, on, what, on what basis do you say that it's then it remains a relevant factor? For the so then, then the piece of land is a piece of land that for 90 one years was a piece of open space. Then it became a private piece of land, but it remained open space. It remained physically it remained open. Space. It remained open visually, as we know, visual visually. amenity is an important function of open space. And, uh, albeit in private ownership, uh, it was then still <coughs> relevant for the committee to take account of the history of that site as a part of, as a piece of open space. And the desirability that it might in future uh, remain as a piece of visual amenity or at some point be accessible again to the public. So the committee's role was the long term strategic planning, and all those factors are relevant to that decision.
Thank you. Just as far as this court's discretion is concerned, um, the, the point, the submission I make about um, Edwards, um, my lords may be familiar with the decision in the House of Lords there. In the Edwards case, uh, Mr. Edwards managed to ultimately make an argument that uh, a planning commission was, uh, it was a, an industrial commission, uh, was unlawful. But by the time the case came to the House of Lords, all the reasons why it was all to do with air quality had been resolved. And the House of Lords said, well, in, at this juncture, it's futile to, to quash it because matter, events have overtaken it. And so the reason that's helpful is because it shows that when the court, this court is considering its discretion on remedy, it can look at events subsequent yes, as relevant to that discretion. Yes, that's right. And so what we know is going on now is we've seen the auditor's letter. We know that the council has got its own Queen's Council, Mr Redfern, investigating those terms of reference as to its conduct with the Town Council. And so there's still possibilities open that will come out of that that may contribute towards the possibility of this site in the long run uh, being not only a piece of visual amenity but, a, but even a, an accessible piece of recreation ground if those restitutionary measures are what come out of those investigations. So again, uh, I say... I'm sorry, I don't, I don't understand that. The, the investigations are into the council's conduct. Yes. We, we know the council acted unlawfully. Yes. Uh, conduct's a different question. Um, but but how can an investigation into their conduct um, result in sort of restitution? Well, one of the issues that my client's pursuing with the council is that the monies paid should be held on trust. This is a completely separate point to this claim, but that the, the that's not the, in or the there. Structures. Doesn't affect the that won't affect the land. No, but the uh, the remedy that, that that will be pursued by the community or by my client will be that they buy it back and and restore it to the regular in the long run. But using the money that's held on trust. The money, the purchase price paid. So right. it's, I think it's five hundred and fifty thousand pounds paid. Well. Um, the, the developer is not bound to sell it back. No. Uh, uh, and, 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 and indeed, we've, we've raised and, it. And, I mean, uh, uh, th th this is a rhetorical question, uh, and it's important you don't give evidence, but uh, why would the developer sell it back for 550000 Because... Well, um, if it, this claim succeeds, he has no planning permission, and so the land uh, hmm. is, is severely... He's got, a, he's got a claim for compensation. Uh, he, he, as, as, as the judge below observed, he may seek. To, he may have a claim. He may seek to set aside the contract, which would be, from my client's point of view, ideal, <laughs> because it would get us back to the position that he was seeking uh, to ensure. So, all, all, the only reason to bring this in is that to, to ensure that when this court is applying its discretion, it isn't thought that this is a hopeless cause. It, none of this is going to make any difference, as clearly the judge below thought. Is to make clear that there is an ongoing. Campaign. I'll, I'll, say that. I'll, say that. I'll say that broad point. Yeah, that, that's that's the only relevance of these points. Yeah. Um, so, my lord, <coughs> my lady, that um, with with one and um, reference, if I may, to the Gathercole uh, case, which is the recent court of appeal judgment on the section thirty one two a provision. Um, is at 47, tab 47, and paragraphs 35 onwards are the relevant passage. Uh, and then at 30, paragraph 36, the court cited the Court of Appeals judgment in Crown going on Thames Parish Council against South Oxfordshire District Council. And the important part of that passage is, first of all, the reference to Lord Justice Limbong's judgment in Williams, and then at 55, so the indented 55, it's axiomatic that when performing the duty, or equally when exercising its discretion as to relief, the court must not cast itself in the role of the planning decision maker. See the judgment of Lord Justice Limbong in Williams at paragraph 72. 
if either the court is to consider whether a particular outcome is highly likely not to have been substantially different if the conduct complained of had not occurred, it must necessarily undertake its own objective assessment of the decision-making process and what its result would have been if the decision-maker had not erred in law. And then over the page of 38, it's important that a court faced with an application for judicial review does not shirk the obligation imposed by Section 312A. The provision is designed to ensure, even if there's been some flaw in the decision-making process which might render the decision unlawful, where the other circumstances mean that quashing the decision would be a waste of time and public money, uh, the decision must not be quashed and the application should instead be rejected. The provision is designed to ensure that the judicial review process remains <coughs> flexible and realistic. So that's my reference there to the process being realistic. And my submission is that the judge erred in her approach in light of that because her assessment of how the committee, her objective assessment of how the committee would exercise its judgment, is not realistic. Uh, and oversteps the boundary into that forbidden, that axiomatically forbidden territory of uh, second-guessing the, uh, putting oneself too much into the shoes of the decision-maker and not allowing those discretions which are for the decision-maker to be played out properly. I want to just, uh, if I may, um, respond to my learned friend's supplementary argument here because it raises an interesting and helpful issue actually uh, about uh, Article 1, Protocol 1, which actually informs the way in which Ground 1 I'll, I'll pursue that. So if I can just deal with that quickly. Um, so the court probably would have seen and a friend's supplementary skirting about 10 days ago was filed. And where is it in the bundle? Yeah. It's not in the bundle, it was filed after the bundles were prepared. Mm. I have nothing but the bundles. Correct, me too. Okay. Uh, well, the court hasn't had it in that case. Um, no. I was going to raise it. I don't it. think I have any. Uh, un unless somebody's put it in the bundle. I, I certainly haven't got it. No. Um, well, I was in any event going to say uh, there hadn't been an application to admit it or, or to amend the respondent's notice to rely on it. The, the, the basic premise of it was uh, a short pleading uh, that uh, to find in favour of the appellant's um, uh, understanding of the law would breach Article 1, Protocol 1 because it would deprive the landowner of his rights uh, to the land. Um, I, uh, That's an ambitious submission. It, it, it is ambitious, and um, I, I'm, I'm going to nonetheless take uh, the court. Um, I maintain the objections on the procedural points, but um, having looked at the case law on it, uh, the Oxfordshire case on Village Greens, the, the Trap Gowns case, is actually quite. Um, well, I, um, <laughs> the trouble is, we're hearing your arguments on it without having seen yeah. the argument in favour of it. Yes. And, uh, not sure this is the most efficient way of proceeding. No. Uh, what I would, I mean, I don't know whether there are copies of this supplemental I, I don't know. skeleton in court. Um, Mr. Garvey, you don't have copies, do you? Uh, my lord, my, my lords, my lady, I don't. Uh, I'm taking instructions now as to whether those instructions we seek to rely on this point, given that it's not before the court. Uh, the, the, right. One, I, I've only just heard about the point, but mm. one, one problem that I see is that. Uh, as we established at the outset, whatever the obligations and rights are, they're derived from a statute. Yes, that's a good um, And, and uh, that doesn't mean to say that any A1, P1 argument is hopeless, but it makes it pretty tricky, I would have thought, because the, the, the rights will be um, uh, replaced with other rights, rights to compensation, all sorts of things. But hence, my, hence my epithet, ambitious. Yeah. My lords, my lady, I hear your point, and I'll, I'll take instructions over over the, the lunch. I imagine um, as to whether it's a point that the defendant seeks to allow. Thank you very much. Um, can we turn to tab twenty nine? Um, and it's the Oxford decision. Um, no, we're not looking at this at the moment. No, I appreciate that. Um, I'm so we I mean, why do we go to the Oxford decision if we're not looking at this yet? It also illuminates my ground one that I'm moving on to next. So it is helpful to understand 
Uh, and it's on paragraph 59. So which tab is it? Uh, tab, tab 29, my lord. Thank you very much. But we're really on ground one, one now. Well, we're moving into ground one, gradually. Uh, so was this cited by either of you in your skeleton? No, so this was. So why is this in the bundle? Oh, I see it's been added. This has been added to the bundles, but not all. The bundles have been prepared on the basis of the supplemental argument. But yes, yes, I see. All right. Okay. So it's paragraph, paragraph 59. 59. And you'll see at the heading above 58 was that a human rights argument was, was raised in relation to a um, system of prescription for establishing village greens. Uh, it's a helpful context because obviously village greens are established by 20 years prescriptive recreational rights and the question was whether that interfered with A1, P1 and that's dealt with at 59 and Lord Hoffman there referring back to the decision of the European Court of Human Rights in Pi distinguished that in fact the Grand Chamber in fact overturned that decision subsequently but that's not crucial. Uh, and he said that the European Court at sea, the European Court stressed two matters. First, that the applicant's rights over the land were entirely extinguished. And secondly, that title was transferred by operation of law to another private individual. So this was a case about whether adverse possession infringed Article 1, Protocol 1. And he said that in that case, the first made it a deprivation and the second made it difficult to justify as a control of the use of property in the general interest. In the present case, first, the owner retains his title to the land and his right to use it in any way which does not prevent its use by the inhabitants for recreation. And secondly, the system of registration of the 1965 Act was introduced to preserve open spaces in the public interest. So that's my, my Lord's point about the statute. Um, <clears throat> so the reason that feeds in now to what I'm going to be saying about ground one is that the distinction there is between possessions under Article 1, Protocol 1 and control of use and in the text of A1P1 it says uh, a person's possessions shouldn't be interfered with uh, but that does, not a, that does not extend to control of use and what Lord Hoffman does is to distinguish the recreational rights over a village green here as being rights to use the land but the owner retains his title to the land and so there's no interference with the A1P1 right, because title remains, notwithstanding use rights. And so the structure of that distinction then flows into my ground one, the distinction between uh, title and use of the land. Yeah. Because you say um, that the impact, as I understand it, of the statutory provisions is that nobody could challenge the ownership rights of the developer in respect of the land because one looks at um, at the sections the fact that there has been a breach by the town council of its obligations to um, make notifications before disposing of the land doesn't affect the legal right to ownership passing to the, the developer against the rest of the world and um, he is not fixed with constructive notice of that failure because the statute specifically says uh, you don't have to make such inquiry as to whether or not that's happened. But your, your position, I think, departing from Mr Garvey, uh, is that that is the be-all and end-all of it uh, and it doesn't affect the statutory trust one way or another because it doesn't deal with how that land is to be utilised once it's been owned. Is that the point? That is Again, a very helpful summary, my lady. Uh, and if I may add one nuance that I'll develop, either one, it doesn't affect the statutory trust one way or another, or one has the subsisting rights point that I say the judge found, yes. where the rights are no longer enforceable, but they still subsist. Yeah. And so that then leads to the question, are subsisting but unenforceable rights material to a planning committee's decision uh, in relation to open space? And I submit that they are. So it's, it's those two positions. Either the trust continues entirely or the subsisting rights continue. And either, on either front, that remains a material consideration for the committee. Do we have anything in the bundles that helps to illuminate the history of the um, provisions of the statute that preserves the ownership rights? Uh, the 
provisions are um, modelled on uh, prior provisions in the uh, 1933 Local Government Act and the 1959 uh, Town and Country Planning Act, which similarly uh, sought to preserve them, and we do have those in the bundle. Right. Uh, and I think it's section 29, from memory of the... Well, I don't want to take you out of turn, but speaking for it's myself, fine. I think yeah. I, I would find it quite helpful yeah, so um, to get a handle on this, to just understand what led to those provisions, what, what those provisions were actually to, yes. to uh, deal with. So tab 5 of the bundle, section 29 of the Town and Country Planning Act 1959, Yeah. This is still in force. So this is tab which tab five. Five of the authorities bundle. Of the authorities bundle. <coughs> so this is still in force, but not in force in relation to the where, where the local government act provisions apply. It's specifically disapplied by by one of the sections. Um, so this is the 1959 Act. Yeah. And one sees a similar <coughs> kind of provision to section 128, but it's concerned only with ministerial consent requirements here. And it says that where after the commencement of this Act, an authority to whom this part of the Act applies purport to acquire, appropriate, or dispose of land under an enactment, whereby power to acquire, appropriate, or dispose of land is conferred on the authority or on a class of authorities to whom this part of this Act applies, then in favour of any person claiming under the authority, that's the same language, the acquisition, appropriation, or disposal so purporting to be made shall not be invalid by reason that any consent of a minister which is required has not been given. And a person with authority or with a person claiming under the authority shall not be concerned to see or inquire whether any such consent has been given. So that only relates to the ministerial consent component of section 128. Section 128 uh, also applies the shall not be concerned to inquire provisions to circumstances where so the... the 1959 <coughs> Act, yeah. Section 29 was in the original Act in the 1959 And Act. still in force. Mm. Yeah. So, yes. Now, you, you referred then to Section 128. So 128 is the current provision. Of the 1972 Act. Of the 1972 Act. But what Act. was in force... Before the 1972 so the, was the 1933 Act. Local Government Act was the preceding Section, Local Government Act. Sec, so this um, is a tab. Three so or we four. have sections 165 and 179, but it, um, which are at three and four. But there wasn't an equivalent um, to section 128 within the Local Government Act. So just a, so 165. So 165 was the power to sell, so this is the old yeah. section 123. And that required the consent of the minister. Would that have applied to this land in, in 1933? Mm -hmm. This land was acquired in 1925 under existing the Public Health Act or the Open Spaces Act. Or whatever. So would this so, section have applied? That point. Well, from from when it was passed, yes. I yes, mean, that's there, what I mean. there was. I don't believe another. There wasn't another local government act prior to no. So this would have from nine. Whenever this came into force, this yes. would have applied to the land in issue here. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so, and also we've got in the next tab another section from the thirty three act. That yes, right? that's section one seven nine and D is. Uh, is one of the predecessors. D, is it? Nothing in this act shall... Authorise the disposal. Is that R? But, sorry, do you re is it 179D? Yes. But does that apply to this land? No. This was no. a predecessor provision, just no. in answer to my lady's question about in the, 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 the history. No, but in 1933, was this the land where concerned? Yes. So this would have applied in it 1933. Would have. I see. So because breach of... Trust, yes, applied because to the sort of trust a, we're talking about. It would have applied to a, a statutory trust, yes. Yes, all right. So, so as that well as a private trust. Didn't. Uh, hold on. So the Act did not authorise the disposal. Oh, yes, sorry. Breach of trust. So or nothing would authorise the disposal of land, whether by sale, in breach of any 
statutory provision under the Open Spaces Act or whatever it was. Well, in breach of any trust, so that could be a charitable trust. No, no, but, but I, never mind about that. What about this trust, the statutory trust we're concerned it, with? It does encompass this it trust. It does, well. that's yes. all we're concerned with. Yeah. So, so the power conferred by Section 165 did not apply to this piece of land? Uh, correct. So there was no, was there any power to dispose of the land? Well, uh, ministerial consent would be required, so that, then there would be Section 47 later of the Town and Country Planning Act. Well, I'm misunderstanding uh, what you're telling us now. So, so, so 179 so, yeah. says that nothing in this part of this Act uh, um, shall authorise the disposal of land by a local authority in breach of any trust. Yes. So, so there does that mean... Not a provision that entitled the sale in breach of trust. Sorry. What? So at that juncture, yes. Uh, sale in breach of trust was only possible with ministerial consent. Well, is that well, right? Well, I, I don't understand. No, Sorry, forgive sure me. 165 is that part of the, in the same part? Part 179. Yes, it is. Well, I, I don't understand. It, it looked to me, therefore, as 179d would exclude 165. I think the putting these together might be easier if we go to one of the authorities because they uh, the Laverstock case at 18 right. um, is a case under the preceding provisions so we can see how they okay. tied together there right. because it is quite complex and, and Miss Justice Goff so, had to grapple with oh, it yes. there. Oh, yes. And so what happened in the Laverstock case was that the uh, one sees in the head note the plaintiffs became entitled to the benefits of a contract between the defendant corporation, so that's the local authority Peterborough Corporation, and a company M Limited for the sale to M Limited of wasteland acquired by the corporation under the Unders Open Spaces Act 1906. Yes. In the in the in the contract there was a special condition, which said uh, until ministerial approvals and consents to the release of the land from the restrictions and obligations of the Open Spaces Act 1906 were obtained, the uh, sale couldn't be completed. And then um, Special Condition K had not been satisfied when the corporation in August 1954 entered into an agreement under seal with M Limited, which recited that release from those restrictions depended on the making of an order under Section 42 of the Town and Country Planning Act 1947. So that's the provision my Lord was asking about. So that enabled ministerial consent for breach of the Open Spaces Act statutory trust to be facilitated. Um, well, you, we're going to this to see the relevant statutory provisions, yeah. so let's go to those for the moment. You may want to come back to this case, but let's just see so, the statutory provision. So what happened here was that there was an agreement... No, I just want to see the... Sorry to be sorry. awkward. Let's just see the statutory provision. They are on page 1405. So, what are we pointing to here? So the first of all, 165. 165. Yes. At B to C. Which determines whether the power conferred by 165. So pausing, I mean, looking at that letter that between F and H, that is rather making the point, isn't it, that Section 179D prevents Section 165 from operating? Yes. Yes. Um, so, so then there was the argument, which I just asked you about, actually, what trust meant. Um, and Mr Justice Goff. I think, therefore, must conclude that trust includes this type of trust. Yes, and then the, the finding of Miss Justice Goff on this question, actually, is at uh, uh, 1408A. So that the trust cannot be overridden by Section 165. Sorry, what did you say? Um, yeah. So this is at the bottom of 
1407, is it? Uh, 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 yes, and the top of 148. In doing this, I expressly saved the operation of the power in 165 in conjunction with any other operation which it may be submitted abrogates the trust in section 10. But it can't be overridden by that power alone. So, so, um, so looking at sorry, just getting back to these. Yeah, looking at the position uh, as at 1933. Um, so we haven't seen anything that would permit the local authority to have disposed of this piece of land. Even with the consent of the minister. Yeah. At 1933, right. I, I, I. So when did the so okay? I, I'm fairly sure that that's there was right. a power. That's right. There was, there, there was no power to dispose. There was no power. Yeah. Okay. So that's the position in 1933. You then were showing us um, just looking at this chronologically, the 1959 Act. Yes, so then there was the 47 Act where the so, consent of the Minister under Section 42, that's what was at issue in Laverstock itself. But the problem for Laverstock was they just couldn't get the Minister to consent, and so they were trying so, to... So, just sorry, you'll have to explain. Did so, the 1947 Act introduce a power to dispose of this type of land? That was... Um, so that's just summarised in the headnote at FTG. Uh, release from the restrictions under the Open Spaces Act 1906 depended on the making of an order under Section 42 of the Town and Country Planning Act 1947. Just hold on. I see. You had to... I see. So, does that... So, at any rate, the Town and Country Planning Act 1947 introduced a procedure whereby... Yes. The land could be disposed of by the local authority. That's right. And so... All right, so that's helpful. Um, there's some more detail you. on that in, on 1404, but that, that's the basic, uh, my understanding. And the um, the result was that where Laverstock couldn't get the ministerial position, they'd in fact built all, the, built all over this open space. Well, I don't think we're so concerned with that. Right. I really just think we're trying to understand the statutory history. That's what my lady asked, and, and I, for one, agree also. It's helpful to know. So the position we've got to, as I understand it, is that by the 1947 Act, there was a procedure under Section 42 whereby the local authority could dispose of um, land such as this. Yes. OK. With an order under. And that, with an order, and that was, which was said, making of an order, anyway. Right. And uh, we, was there we, any say? We, sorry, we haven't got section seven. We don't no. have that. Sorry, I, I didn't anticipate. No, I've okay. tried I to, to make it as far as possible, but I'm sorry. I yes. didn't it doesn't that. seem to be in, in um, Mr. Justice's judgment either. Mm. No. The, the terms of. But all right. So we know for certain that from 1947 onwards, there was the power. There was a power subject to a procedure to dispose of land such as this. The question then is. Um, when when were there first introduced provisions which, as it were, uh, saved the transferee in the event that the procedure had not been gone through? Um, which are now contained in the Africa, which is the second. Yes, yeah, so I, I've, I've just uh, highlighted the sort of precursor to the current provisions, which is the 1959 Act, so Section 59. 59. Okay, so that's in tab? Tab 5. 5, thank you. <coughs> well, that's the first provision then that introduces a protection for the buyer of the yes. land. And, and the, it is ministerial. I mean, yes. this, this is a, I mean, this would apply to a disposal of the land in question here. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 
So the, the formula used in, in Section 29 carries forward into the current legislation, doesn't it? Yes. With right. the added context of the need to consult publicly on disposal of open indeed, space land. Indeed, but it, it, the, the section absolutely, one this, the, the approach is this. Because you no longer need ministerial approval, do you? You just have to go through, what I suggest, you have to go through the advertising and so on. Uh, you do, I mean, for, for, for common land, for example. Oh, no, no, I meant for the land here. Right. I, that's what I'm concerned about, <coughs> the land here. Yeah. You don't need ministerial consent any, yeah. anymore. Um, but the, for, the saving formula is pretty well word for word the same, I think. Yes. Mutated. mutated. Yes, all right, thank you. That's very helpful. So up to, just thinking aloud, up till 1959, mm. if the requisite ministerial consent stroke order had not been obtained, there was no power to dispose of the land and therefore no power to confer good title upon the purchaser of the land and the purchase uh, and therefore the sale and purchase agreement would be voidable or void yeah. uh, and the purchaser had no security at all yes so that's the context for the introduction of the 1959 mm. act power yes and subsection mm. a undoubtedly um, uh, stops the disposal from becoming invalid and un unenforceable. That I think we can probably agree on. Yes. The $64,000 question is what, if anything, subsection B adds to that? Because uh, I, for one, would like to know what your response is as to what is the um, purpose and effect yep. uh, of subsection B. Uh, if this is only concerned with um, protecting the purchaser? The, uh, one of the authorities, and I'm sorry I can't remember exactly which one, but I'll find it later, mm -hmm. says that the purpose of B is that a person dealing with the authority, in other words, someone negotiating, for example, an equitable interest that will later be affected, or a person negotiating an option agreement, or whatever the form of disposal might be, uh, also is not required to go through the onerous job of checking that the ministerial consent or the consultation requirements of the case may be uh, have been fulfilled so it's at both stages it's not simply upon transfer it, it gives it gives protection to the uh, successor or the dis the, the pr prospective disponee but, but the, the, the real question is is what protection it gives and, what, and um, it, it seems to me that um, Section 29 of the 1959 Act is is important because, as my lord said, it's the same formula yes. as we have to grapple with. <clears throat> as I understand it, b b before 1959, we, we, we need to see Section 42 of the 1947 Act, I think, just to see precisely what that says. But yeah. um, w s certainly before then, before 1947, uh, we've established that a local where there was um, this sort of statutory trust the local authority had no power to dispose of the land at all mm. and then there's the 1947 Act, whatever that, that does, but it sounds as though that, that allowed dis mm. uh, the power to dispose it granted a power to dispose uh, subject to, we think uh, the minister making an order that that was okay um but th th that, that doesn't answer the question as to whether the disposal was uh, subject to the trust, because the whole purpose is, no. is one of the purposes is to get over the trust. Um, and it, it still leaves open the question as to what Section 29B of the 1959 Act meant, because that, that, that's its successor is the main statutory provision we're con concerned with. Yes, um, and there isn't much authority on Section 29, or, or certainly nothing I found that was of any use in illuminating that. I but, but we know what 29 1A does. That, yeah. that, that allows title to pass. <coughs> yes. Well, title does pass. Um, but in terms of 29 1B, a person dealing with the um, selling authority 
shall not be concerned to see or inquire about whether such consent has been given. Well, one of the purposes of the consent is to override any trust. We think, uh, subject to the, what the 1947 Act says. Yeah. Um, and, and this is a statutory provision which says, well, the purchaser doesn't have to be bothered by this. Well, he'd be jolly bothered if he's going to buy um, land subject to a trust A, he knows nothing about, B, he probably can't find out about, and C, which the statute says he's not concerned with. I just don't understand that. Um, can we go... I think... Well, can I go through my submissions in, in, in detail? Yes, 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 of course. Um, jump to yes. the sort of key answers too no, much. No, of course, because there are other statutory provisions as well. And I think we should also look at the others as well yes. before I answer all of those yes. points. Um, just look at the... Um, I'm wondering... I did bring with me the... Um, 72 Act as originally enacted, which which is really only to understand the history, because the section, subsections 2A and 2B are obviously amendments which came in in 1980. Mm. So I've got the original version as well in my back pocket, as it were, if the court wants to see it. It doesn't really, it's not for any grand point, it was just to see the legislative history if the court was interested. Well, do, so far as we're concerned, is it really just the addition of 2A and 2B? Or well, 2A and 2B gets added to the local government yes. Act in 1980. Yes, but... Um, well. Were there other material changes? Yes. So the original... Um, yes, because... It, well, I think if you've got them in a handy form there, they uh, why not hand them up and okay. show us? Um, can I just start, I'm just asking my instructor solicitor to prepare them a bit more efficiently, if that doesn't mind the general setting. Um, There's, there's various additions. If we just go to the, the, the modern provisions mm. uh, while that's being prepared, yes. they are at tab six. <coughs> so, and it starts with section 122, which is the appropriation of land powers. <coughs> will see um, appropriation of land by principal council subject to the following provisions of this section the principal council may appropriate for any purpose for which the council are authorised by this or any other enactment to acquire land by agreement any land which belongs to the council etc but, but um, the town council is not a principal council section, uh, is it, is it, no. section 122 is only relevant because 2A and 2B are, are, are dragged back in later on into parish council in that's right, by section 127. Yes, that's right. Because uh, the, the town council is a parish council, as I understand. It, 126. it is, yes. So one two, section 126 sort of re reapplies 122 to parish councils and community councils, and section 127 applies section 123. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Uh, so we can read, when we look at 122, we can read it as if a principal council said a parish council. Yes. Yes, all right. And one sees that the appropriation power, a principal council may not appropriate under section subdivision one above land which they may be authorised to appropriate under section 229 of the Town and Country Planning Act unless, and then there is um, a similar set of provisions. So which, which so, section? Sorry, 122 2B, also like, like when disposing of land, provides for notice of intention of appropriation to be advertised in two consecutive weeks in a newspaper and objections considered. Right. So where a local authority wants to develop open space, it can appropriate it, which means put it over to a different purpose, but it has to go through the same consultation procedures and provided for disposal. And then there are similar provisions related to the section 164 the 1875 Act at 2A and 2B. Yes. And as I understand it, it's common ground that um, 2B only applies 
where the um, requirements of 2A are satisfied. I hope that's common ground. I don't, I don't speak for them as, as no, necessary. As, as you understand, it's common ground. Yes. Because the, the, the wording is slightly peculiar. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's right. If that's common ground, I am sure it's right. Um, but the land, of course, isn't appropriated by... Well, it's certainly not appropriated under subsection 2A. It's appropriated under section, uh, subsection mm -hmm. 1. Uh, but I think it, it simply means that it, it's where it's appropriated with those conditions having been satisfied. Yes. With those requirements having yes. been satisfied. Yes. And then the same applies over the page then to the disposal power. Yes. It's the same structure. Yes. Um, the, the 2B. Uh, and again, as, as my Lord says, the language of it at the end of 2B is slightly unusual. The land shall, by virtue of the disposal, be freed from any trust arising solely by virtue of its being land held in trust for the enjoyment of the public in accordance with the said section 164 or section 10. So where 2A conditions are satisfied, the trust goes. The trust is disposed of. Yes. By the trust goes by virtue of the disposal. Yes. Right. Um, now, the more extreme tendency of the respondent's case, the respondent argues that even where 2A isn't complied with, the same effect is achieved. So what's the purpose of 2A? So what's the purpose of 2A? <laughs> well, you would think the natural corollary of that construction is if you don't comply with it, the trust doesn't go. Indeed. One would think that is the natural corollary of that. Yes. Until you suddenly get into the realms of section 128. And, and hence why I say that word subsist was accurately inserted into the judgment by the judge. Because the land is disposed of, but the 2A process not having been followed, the recreational rights pursuant to the statutory trust subsist. Of course, given that it's not um, a proper trust in the private law sense, yes. uh, what we've now got is a third party coming into the frame who neither has the obligation nor the right, because the obligation can't by this statute pass to the uh, purchaser, can it? Well, one strand of my argument is that the recreational rights, just as with a village green or a highway, continue to be enjoyed. So that's the, the more right. That's that's the more bold uh, end of my suggestion. Uh, so even as against a third party private owner, just as recreational rights do against third party private owners, highways, um, village greens, etc. So the title is not abnegated, but the recreational right rights over the land persist or subsist. But if the right is a corollary of the obligation, how can you have the rights subsisting if the obligation doesn't pass to the owner? Well, then you get to the, the judge's view, which is my second big position. But she says the rights, insofar as they subsist, are not enforceable. Well, I, I, I follow that. I, I'm just at the moment trying conceptually to yeah. understand your argument as to how the rights continue if the obligations don't pass. Uh, or are you saying that the obligations do pass? Well, I can understand. I can understand a position where you say um, the so-called trust, that is the obligation and the corollary rights are maintained and they both pass over so that the landowner, the new landowner is basically foisted with all of this. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that the rights and the obligations um, remain theoretically possible but they're not binding at all on the landowner. But at the moment I'm struggling with this halfway house of the obligation not passing to the landowner but the rights um, still being enforceable against yeah. him. So let me explain that idea. Um, and, and just very quickly, if we pick up um, about four pages from the end of this tab, the definitions section, which is section 270 of the Local Government Act 1972. So where are we? Sorry, which tab are we? So tab uh, six is yep. the Local Government Act 1972. Four pages from the end is section 270. Yes. And uh, on the third page of definitions, is the definition of land at the top of the page. 
and we see land includes any interest in land and any easement or right in to or over land. Now that's relevant because the section 123 power to dispose is to dispose of land and so we're talking here therefore about any disposals of not just freehold interests but uh, leasehold, short tenancies are even mentioned it's in section 123 itself, uh, as well as easements and rights in or over land. And so this idea of the rights subsisting following uh, an unlawful disposal I think can be understood more helpfully by thinking about kinds of disposal which are encompassed here. So take the example of a, pers of a, of a disposal of a short tenancy. There's no compliance with the section 1232A process. Short tenancy is granted. The next day, family go and play football as they've always done on the recreation ground as they knew it. Are they now trespassers because the trust has been extinguished by that disposal? So my submission, that's where the subsisting rights come into play. And at the end of that short tenancy, of course, there's no reason the trust can't continue to be administered by the local authority in its full... Yes, but I mean, that, that's true. But what, what, what is the... Answer? You pose the question quite rightly, are members of the public trespassers? So what's the answer to that? Well, and the answer is that they have a subsisting well, recreational well, right. Well, that, but that's... Just a, that's, uh, I mean, that doesn't help answer the conundrum in this case. I mean, that's just consistent with your basic submission. Uh, but the example you give, I mean, the one answer to the example you give is that the that the rights are suspended by the tenant, short tenancy. So yes, they haven't gone forever, but while there's a, a tenancy there, yes, they can't continue. They can't exist together. And and that would be another example consistent with what I say the judge was getting at when saying that there are subsisting rights. So they're not, they're dormant maybe, but they're not No, but this, this is, I don't think this is a good analogy at all, is it? Because if it's a short tenancy then, or any tenancy, let's say it's a five-year tenancy, um, at, the, at the expiry of the tenancy, um, the um, uh, local authority still ho holds the freehold reversion and, uh, and there's no reason why the rights should not at that point uh, as it were, reassert themselves because, as you write, as you put it, they're dormant. But that's a different situation if you have disposed of your entire interest, which is but what it, we're concerned but with. But it's not different in terms of section one two eight of the statute because the same yeah. impacts would be felt from section one two eight, whatever the kind of disposal. Yes, but that's I agree. But in that case, the tenant, the short, the the if if you're wrong about this. Then the, the the tenant would, I mean, the tenant has the protection that one two eight two gives it. Yes. And the question is, what protection does it give it? So the the, the tenant's lease yes. can't be impugned by correct locals saying we've got this right to yep. create. That's yep. that's what section one two eight says. Yeah. But it, but what that demonstrates is that the the suggestion or the tendency towards suggesting that the rights might be extinguished upon disposal can't be right. Well, they may be extinguished in the sense that while the tenancy is on foot, they they have no present application. They are they, they are, the they are sorry? subsisting, but not I, th I, I think this is a. If I, I don't actually find this illuminating. <laughs> I think you're sort of adding. I'm adding another, in a sense, example, but I don't. I think that answering this question illuminates what happens when the um, the entire interest of the local authority is disposed of. I'm not so sure because right. if um, if you're right, uh, what what you're saying is that what happens to the rights can't depend upon the type of disposal of the land or the interest that's conveyed. Yeah. So if uh, it's a it's a, a tenancy. Uh, and the tenancy comes to an end, uh, and the ownership remains with the local authority, um, then it would be a, a strange 
outcome, you say, if the rights had been extinguished for all time, so that when it comes back into the hands of the authority, by dint of having granted a short tenancy to somebody, they're no longer bound to treat it as open space. That would be the effect of the or, rights or being or extinguished. Easement. Or indeed an easement in, under the tax of Section yeah. 70. But, uh, but there's, no, there's no reason, is there, Mr Goodman, why... Uh, I mean, as I understand it, your sort of submission is that unless you're right, is this right, the effect of granting a short tenancy is to extinguish for all time the statutory trust. Right. That's your submission? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it is. Well, but why should that be right? Because all what Section 128 focuses on is the position of the tenant and uh, what it is concerned to, to, to see. But, but that's my point, my Lord. I, I right. completely agree that Section 128 focuses on the position of the tenant. Yes, but what I'm because the local again, authority still has a pro has a proprietary interest, has a freehold reversion, and will be subject to the statutory trust for duty. Yes. While while it has uh, a possession, well, it doesn't have possession, does it? But the the ability to control um, the land. But if it's disposed of it completely. In my submission, there's no difference in the statute between the situations. Well, let's just focus on the, the complete disposal. Um, because in, in those circumstances, what is the... I think the first question is, is well, what is the effect of Section 128.2, and particularly 1282b, so far as the purchaser is concerned? The effect is to uh, secure their title. So well, that's, that's, that's certainly that's the a. case of A. And, and to ensure that in conducting those negotiations, I mean, for example, the way in which local authority will often go about these kind of decisions is to grant uh, an equitable interest or to take a decision at committee level that they will uh, dispose of the site only subsequently to then be but isn't that, isn't that effectively what arose in Mr Justice Elias's case? In the structure being yes, case? Yes, where there was a contract entered into, so uh, the equitable interest in the property passed to the purchaser. Yes. But um, the purchaser didn't have the benefit, did they, as I understood it, of the protection of 1282, because the, he said that well, they were seeking... Yes, they were... Yes. They were seeking a uh, specific performance of the contract, if you weren't there, I think. Yes, in, uh, uh, he said I that might have to turn that up to be able to remember. Anyway, you, I think you said there was an authority which assisted you on uh, 1282B. Yes, I'm going to have to find that over our adjournment. Oh, I see. One of these. Right. I can't remember I what it is, but there's one that says... Anyway, you so say that A is dealing with disposals of the legal title, is this right? And B is dealing with disposals of, of equitable interests. Is that is that the diff distinction you draw? Uh, no, no. It's it's the, the dealing with is the process of negotiation. Well, uh, but if all if you're uh, sorry, to be, but I mean if all you've done is negotiate, if you're a purchaser and all you've done is enter into negotiations, uh, well, you don't have any. I mean, there's nothing to protect at that point. It's only when you acquire a right uh, that you need any protection. Because uh, it's to see or inquire whether any such consent has been given, or any requirement has been complied with. So it's looking at looking at the position when the purchaser has acquired something. Must be, mustn't it? And seeing whether whether its position is prejudiced by the failure to um, get the necessary consent or follow the necessary procedure. I mean, I just, sorry, all I was doing was jibbing at your point that it's designed to protect someone during a negotiation. But, I mean, that it, it's not designed to do that. It's de it must be designed to protect some right that the, that the person dealing with the local authority has obtained. It's classic statutory language that one would normally find giving protection against constructive notice arguments. If somebody says, well, you ought to have known that there are, you, you failed to take the relevant steps to find out whether the consents have been given. You knew you were buying something that was open space. 
um, you're, a, you're a sophisticated developer and you could and should have found out for yourself and therefore you can't uh, hide behind your failure. Yeah. Um, and if it weren't for the fact that A is there, um, that might be fairly limited. But uh, what I'm struggling with, speaking for myself, is how B adds anything to A. Because um, if A says, well, the purchase or, or whatever the transaction is goes ahead anyway and is valid, um, there could be no question of constructive notice coming into it uh, to invalidate it. And, um, and therefore, you don't need that extra layer of protection, which feeds into my, my Lord, uh, Lord Justice Hickenbottom's original point about what's it doing there if it's not to, to um, um, take away the trust. Well, there are a whole range of circumstances in which uh, a person may be dealing with uh, the authority or a person claiming under the authority. Um, it could be, for example, in relation to a, uh, a contract to develop the land. Um, so it affords protection in any of those circumstances. Um, so a con when you say a contract to develop the land... Uh, so, for example, a contractor might be... Authority might subcontract to a developer to build a cafe. They, yeah. are, they don't have to worry that they're in breach of trust when they carry out their works or when they are negotiating. Yes, I see. So to my lady's point about discharging the trust I think that, that in my submission does go too far because that in a way is what Mr Justice Elias was saying in the Structor Dean case that it, it fashion, it's a shield but not a sword so yes. it doesn't go so far as to say that um, uh, there was no unlawfulness in the, in the underlying decision to dispose of the land no. but it protects the purchaser against that so um, that continuing unlawfulness can still be relevant in other ways. Yeah. Um, so, in, for that reason, in my submission, to say actually section one two eight two b has the effect of of section one two three two b, the effect of discharging the trust, would be to take it further than is than is consistent with the authority on that. Mr. Goodman, we have to rise now, I'm afraid, and we'll sit again at ten past two. Um, we'll be finishing this afternoon at 4.30, so I hope you'll bear in mind yes, the time, and of course Mr Garvey must have a proper okay. opportunity of um, addressing us. All right. this afternoon. Yes. Well, thank you very much. I, one issue that I was going to raise with you is this, that um, something that's sort of puzzling me about this is that um, the extent to which the obligation of the um, local authority to to um, maintain the land as open space can be divorced from its ownership. Yes. That's a point that I have in mind as to whether the obligation to maintain land which it has acquired for this purpose uh, can survive the disposal of the land. Yes, and that was... I, don't, that, that I just raise that as a point that I, I would like to make, but we'll sit again at uh, ten past two.
got three of them all asking different points in completely out of order. It's like Supreme Court. You know? Yeah, it's no, you're nothing, nothing in here has ever been. You, know, you don't get to say the bit that's there that you want to say. <laughs> I just want you to say in front of Morris. Have you come across Morris? No. Um, didn't even get to introduce myself. <laughs> just, <laughs> and he kind of, it was a permission, but he kept, he goes on. He goes, uh, after about 10 seconds of just making submission, he goes, I've got, uh, stop that, I've got that, next point. <laughs> so he just a bit bombarded with it. Sitting, it sounds like the uh, order's been restored in the United States. Order has been restored in the sense that Trump's won. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, they, um, 